Right, guys, so welcome back to the third episode now of the Terrier's Talk podcast. Um, once again, we're joined by Jay and Jack. Um, it's been an interesting week for sure. Uh, it's been our first week kind of doing the podcast. Uh, the support from everyone has been absolutely overwhelming. Uh, we've gained 50 subs on the YouTube channel. The Twitter page is at 350 nearly. And I think we've got nearly 400 views combined on the first two videos, which is absolutely massive for us considering that we've literally only just started um so thank you all for that um it's been an interesting week certainly uh, over the last you know seven days at Huddersfield Town our deadline day the game against Luton uh potential incomings and that's what we're going to cover in today's uh, episode so I mean the first thing is really deadline day what what do we think about that Lennart? uh yeah um I'll start on that uh so we started on a quite a positive note, uh, to be fair, in deadline day. I think it was about 11 uh, where we announced the signing of uh, Jason Lutweiler on a free transfer, uh, which has um, got a lot of complaints about that. Uh, but I think it's a good bit of business because um, we only had two senior goalkeepers and one of them is 20, 21. I don't know how old Scott yeah. is. Yep. 21, right, yeah. Um, so he's done all right for Fleetwood earlier in the season. Um I'm not actually too sure why he was released or maybe it was in a six-month deal, but uh, it's good that we've got him in. Uh, healthy competition. I don't think we'll see him too much, but I'm fairly happy with that. But uh, that was the sort of one positive from deadline day and then it all went steadily downhill from there. Yeah, definitely. Uh, like you said, um, I think after Luke Wilder was announced at about 11, we were kind of uh, thinking we were for a good day. Um, and overall, it wasn't. I mean, we had John Penog, new uh, three-year deal, which is massive. But then from then on, it, it just went totally dormant. Um, and we saw clubs like Derby County putting players from the ears. Um, and if they can do that, you know, why can't we? Um, and I think um, in the final hour, we were linked with uh, Joseph Drimmich and Matt Smith, and nothing came of that. Um, but I think the only... A kind of tangible positive outcome of the window would be this interest in him on the ass. I know we didn't um, sign him, but what, from what it sounds like, he's, um, you know, hopefully he can um, get a deal with us. Now, we will discuss that later. Um, but if Nias did come in, Ben, um, what would you, you know, what do you think he'd add to the team? Uh, I mean, it adds, it adds experience. So... We're quite an experienced team already, but I think it adds something different. I think him, Fraser Campbell, and Danny Ward are completely different players um, in the way that they are up front. I think that Nyasi has got quite a lot of pace to him. He's a strengthy forward. Uh, he's got experience in Europe. Uh, he's got experience in the Prem. Um, as, I mean, as well as Fraser Campbell, but obviously, I think Umar Nias has kind of he, he's performed at a higher level than uh, Fraser Campbell has. Um, I think it, I think it's a good signing uh, on a free. I don't really think it's there's any risk to it. You know, if it's a free. It's just a case of whether he's fit enough. But obviously, I think um, I think he'll get up to that. It, it's a weird one because obviously I think that on deadline day there was I think nine uh, potential incomings. Um, so it, it's, it's it's a bit underwhelming because part of me thinks, well, would it, would any of these nine been as good? Because I think we were interested in uh, Adebayo, um, who went to Luton, even though we offered a higher fee. I think I've seen on Twitter. So it kind of leads you to think, well, why why did we not get Adebayo if that was like our kind of primary target? Uh, there was a lad from uh, Ipswich, uh, Jackson, or is it? I think it is. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it just leads you to think. Where has where has them deals gone wrong, uh, and why are we going to Nias now? Although Nias is a good signing, not um, it's it leads you to think why we're looking in the free market if there was the opportunity to get them strikers. What actually went wrong behind the doors, and I don't really know if that'll be something that we find out soon in press conferences or what. Uh, it's not really been addressed in press conferences. Uh, Carlos kind of hinted towards. The fact that there was going to be a free agent coming in, uh, I think at this point we all know that that's pretty much nailed on to be the ass. If there's any others, we don't know. But I think it's kind of it's somewhat underwhelming because there was the chance to have other strikers, and there's if there was nine lined up, why do we not get any of them nine? 
Yeah, I completely agree. I um, first of all, I think the ass coming in would be. I think it, I'd, I'd really like that. I think it's easy to forget that um, in seventeen eighteen he matched Steve Mounier's goal tally in the Premier League, um, which is uh, fairly impressive for a player who didn't have a locker the year before. Um, yeah. Yeah, which I'm sure I'm sure we've all heard that story, but it doesn't. It doesn't. While it, it helps, and I personally believe he's the best striker that we were linked with on that day or around that time. It doesn't forgive the fact that we failed to get any of our main targets on that day. Uh, I think that shows a lot of naivety um, and incompetence from everyone top to bottom who's involved with transfers. Um, so, yeah, I would be happy with Nias, but it doesn't, it doesn't make up for it. Um, and it doesn't hide the fact that something does need to change before the next window. It's happened two times in a row now. It's happened with Aaron's, and yeah, we got Aaron's in eventually. But with all the injuries we had in between those two windows, having Aaron's in would have been great uh, before then. And he's, he's performing well right now, but he could be performing to a whole new level with an extra half a season behind him. So, yeah, um, I think if we could get Nias in, fantastic. But as I say, it doesn't hide from the fact that we completely failed on deadline day yet again, which is very disappointing. Yeah, definitely. Uh, now, before we touch on the looting game, there's definitely that aspect of losing too late. And I think that adds a lot of pressure, especially um, up top from with Fraser Campbell. And, you know, you mentioned Aaron's earlier, if we could have signed him, which was total incompetence uh, from our kind of side. Um, he could be performing twice of his, you know, what performed um, from yesterday, so to speak. Um, there is definitely that aspect to losing it too late, and as you said, there's that naivety, and I just don't, I just don't think that's kind of been that's kind of been seen because, as you said, we were linked with like nine players on deadline day, didn't get any of them. Um, Adebayo, I don't know what happened with, with him, but he was our top target, as he revealed. Went to Luton and made, you know made an interview um, saying that he'd like to get his back on us. So I just don't see where you know like what's going wrong, and that's not for us to know. I think all the fans want to know. So I think the quicker we do know, or the quicker we do turn it about, um, the better and the happier uh, our fans will be. So I'll let you um, go on to Luton, Ben. Just, uh, just sorry, very quickly. I've gone gone. Uh, just before we do touch on Luton, there's one more bit of business that we've probably all forgot about, that Adama Diakabe, um left uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> on deadline day as well, very late on, just so we can quickly touch on that. Uh, what what do you think of that? I'll go to Ben first. Uh, what do you think of Diakabe finally leaving the club? I think it's one of the best transfers we've had in a very long time because <laughs> at the end of the day, he's on a Premier League wage. Um, yeah. He's... We spent we spent stupid money on him. Uh, for a player that was once been the replacement to Kylian Mbappe, yeah, he was. He was the the guy wasn't anything close to that, and I think that's massively disrespectful it, to him. Um, yeah. I I think that he's 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 hard to kind of put on where it went wrong. Obviously, um, and Benza went to I mean at the end of last season, uh, the last yeah. window, uh, the last January window. He, uh, so I don't know if that was kind of contributed to the fact that um, he's gone to Amiens, whether he spoke to Benzer and you know that's been a kind of decision for him. Um, but I mean, I think it's I think it's a brilliant piece of business to be honest. Mm. Uh, it's a, it's a player on a high wage, leaving for money rather than leaving on a free at the end, and we also get his wage off the books for six months now. So I think it's I think it's a brilliant sale for the club. Uh, Jay, would you agree with me on that? Yeah, definitely. And it shows how much uh, he's made an impact on the club when I totally forgot about his um, departure and moved swiftly on to Luton. But, you know, like I say, he was... He was one of them players where it was just like, where's it going wrong? And we saw some flourishes of him um, when he had a run of games, Blackburn, Hull, Hull City, he's changed the game. Um, and it's it's a hard one because he just never seemed like he was bothered. And um, overall, it is, like you said, it's a brilliant, brilliant transfer to get, I'm guessing, more than 20 grand a week off our wage books and uh, kind of invest that in 
other markets is an absolutely brilliant decision. And I think um, for me, I hope he does well um, because I think a player like him going to a foreign country for the first time, I don't think it would ever be easy for someone to do that. And I'm not, and I'm not defending his performances just because of that, but I really do hope he's uh, more of a comfortable environment now um, and does better than he did at Huddersfield Town because it was a car crash. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. He's He reminds me a lot of the, the kind of Bakuna model of player at Huddersfield Town. You know, he shows glimpses of something, but never really has a massive chance to get into it. I think Bakuna has kind of showed that he's now very much deserving of his place. Yeah. Um, but, like, just on, on deadline day as well, I mean, when uh, when Phil first came to the club, I think he said uh, three three windows and then he can be judged. But, I mean, I think what's vital to think about as well is he's also been through a global pandemic. And I've seen on Twitter people have said that it's, he, he's hiding behind the pandemic. But realistically, uh, for a club that is so focused on being a community club, I think there are more important things to think about than getting a, a £10 million striker, a £5 million striker, a £2 million striker in. Yes, there is obviously the issue there, but we've also got so many players on the books that need to come off. Given the fact that this is probably going to be our team until the end of the season, um, yeah. and I don't see too many players being extended contracts, Pritchard, unless he turns into the next coming of, of Pele, I don't see his contract yeah. being renewed. Yeah, I I don't see a lot of players being contracts being renewed. Fraser Campbell is a it's a weird one. I don't think it will be. I think there's a chance it might be just sort of experience there and a bit of backup, but I don't think it will be. Uh, obviously, I think we know at this point Schindler's probably going to go, um, but that's a massive Premier League wage, let's be honest. It'll probably be, yeah. again, £25,000 a week plus. So there's so many players to get off the books, and I think once they go, I think then we can kind of start to judge it, and then we have three proper transfer windows. Maybe he doesn't need that because I think we had a decent transfer window in the summer. Um, so I mean, I, I could, t- I think you can count that as one. But I think next season's two windows. I think after that point, then that's the three transfer windows, and then that can be decided to properly judge. But given the fact that fans haven't been in stadiums, there's no, there's barely any new revenue coming into the club through sponsors because of yeah. what's happened. I think that it's not fair to judge the club at all. And I think the stick that Phil is getting on Twitter at the moment, I think it's it's unfair because obviously, yes, at, at points you've got to kind of be open with the fans about stuff. And I think our club has been a lot more open um, about stuff than most clubs uh, with Phil saying that, you know, um, his clubs are struggling in the championship. I haven't seen many owners come out and say that. And I mean, it's not like he's he's doing it for himself. He's doing it for like the actual state, like the, the the football pyramid in the in the in the English game. You know what I mean? So I think overall, I think that it's not fair to judge him on these two windows. I think yes, windows have been disappointing. I don't think there's any denying that. And I think probably if you asked him, it, that you might agree. But I think it is a very difficult situation to be in and not one that I don't think anybody could plan for. So I think with what's happened, we've got a few gems here and there with Toffolo, Pifa. I don't know what's happening with Iting, but the loan signing of Iting. And I mean, when players have come in, they've all said, when I spoke to Phil, when I spoke to Lee, when I spoke to Carlos, they've all said that was a major part in them coming in. And Carlos said when he came in, uh, Phil and Lee were a massive part of him coming in. So, I mean, I think that really sums everything up that yes there it's disappointing but players can see what they're trying to build and they can see it's a project totally. so i mean on that i think we'll get on to luton so i mean yeah what what are we thinking about luton yeah just uh just gonna have to apologize for my couple of absences there uh but i think we're all good now so but yeah on to luton um what did we say last time we slow starters and then we build into the game and individual errors define our games I mean, yeah, I don't yeah. mean I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but it's the exact same thing. So no, start is, growing into the game, individual error. Um, so yeah, let's just get that first half was a um, a car crash to put it nicely. Um, we had a nice uh, probably opening fifteen maybe minutes, uh, being generous. Um, some nice passing and moving, uh, typical from what we know of uh, Carlos's football. Um, but then Naby Sarr, uh, under no pressure, gives the ball to um, was it Dewsbury Hall, who nodded it down. Yeah. Uh, it might not have been, but uh, someone nods it down. Naby uh, sprints out, uh, tries to get win the ball. He doesn't. Uh, so that's two errors. 
Um, Keo gets himself in a good position uh, for the cross. He doesn't do anything. Stops. He lets stops the ball run. Pippa just stops tracking Collins, and it's a very, very simple goal, like a training exercise you'd do with dummies and mannequins. <laughs> um, it's, it's pathetic. Uh, I don't mean to be harsh, but it is. It's really, really poor defending again. Um, and you, you've got to wonder, is it ever going to end? Like, is it going to be every single game or majority of the game for the rest of the season? Because it's not even a joke anymore. It is every game that we cost this stupid yeah. goal. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know what your thoughts are, but I'll hand over to someone else now because I'm going to keep ranting if I um, carry on. <laughs> yeah, I'll take the reins uh, and, and just kind of extend on your thoughts. I... I've never watched in my recent memory, uh, especially uh, sat at home on uh, watching the TV. Uh, that might add some frustration, but that was just spineless. It was, uh, and I'm struggling now to to you know to put it into words because it it really was spineless. Where was the where was the intent? You know, in in the first ten fifteen minutes at home, we normally roll teams over, you know, score a goal and then, yeah, you kind of, you, you know, you can afford to kind of sit back and wait till half time and then, you know, get re-energised by, by, by Carlos, but that was inexcusable, I thought, and Benzel was, and you probably agree, I thought it was shocking, I thought they had no um, intent in the game, um, I thought, so, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a simple thing, you, you you give away the ball, and your first instinct should not be I'm gonna step out and try and kill him because it because it wasn't a controlled tackle. He he stepped out and he literally, you know, leg straight through the straight through him, missed the ball. It was just we, we had no threat. We, uh, I think Romney said we had seven crosses, um, and none of them came to effect. Um, I don't know. think that's it. Yeah. Um, anyway. Also, we were sharing heat maps yesterday, and Fraser Campbell was basically playing in um, Jonathan Ogg's role. He was dropping back, and I don't think Campbell should uh, kind of have any criticism for that first half because no one helped him. So how can he help himself? I mean, he, he dropped back and basically did what Harry Kane does every single week. I don't have words to describe that first half, uh, and I will. I'll kind of hand it to you, Ben, because. Honestly, I can't. I can't speak about that. I mean, I said last week, Naby Sal would be a brilliant defender if he didn't have mistakes. Yeah. I think this is now three mistakes in a week. I, I, I mean, off the top of my head, I can only remember the last three games he's had a mistake in each. He's probably had a mistake in the last one and the game before that at this point. And I, I don't want to be negative about Naby Sal because I think, on a free, it's a good. I think it's a very good signing. But there are there are, there are too many mistakes in his game for him to be a top class championship centre half, which is yeah. very frustrating because at times he shows that he is he, he very much could be a top centre half. But the issue is is he has too many mistakes. So we saw last week Bristol. Um he let somebody just walk Stoke. past him. Uh Stoke, the penalty. This week again, he's rushed out, and it, it it's not even like you can blame on inexperience. You know what I mean? He's 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 getting on a bit. I think he's what twenty seven now. Yeah, but he's played at a good level. Yeah, exactly. He's played. He's played in Europe. You know, like he's 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 played at a very very good level, and he's he's got that um he he's got that you know knowledge, he's got that experience. So it leads to the question of what is actually happening to him as a player because you know at times we've seen him be absolutely brilliant but then yeah. these past three games what has happened to the Naby Sar that you know was a man mountain and was a key part of our defence when we had Roman Hibbins Green or Schindler next to him mm. what has happened to that centre half that you know bossed the defence and is now kind of looking like every game if he's isolated it's a massive massive issue and I mean yesterday our entire left side kind of looked Tragic to put it politely, really. Um, you know, Toff was was questionable at times. Going forward, he was all right, but defensively, 
wasn't brilliant and there was just too many gaps uh, allowed on that right hand side I mean Cornick got behind him so many times meaning that Sarah's mm. come across and it really backs that question of is the four is the four at the back the, the right formation for us to be playing I think personally the players are kind of shifting more to a three at the back or at least the full backs are because people mm. again wasn't brilliant and pushed up a bit more. So, I mean, I think we're slowly seeing a change to 3-4-3 or 3-5-2 or something like that. But I don't think that's what Carlos is wanting to play because we saw Hogg stay very much primarily in midfield, whereas we saw Vallejo kind of shift as the game went on, uh, which isn't a criticism of, of Hogg at all. Uh, it's more of a criticism of the fact that I don't think everyone kind of knows at times when they need to be pushing up and when they need to be sitting back. I mean... I don't know if that's just me kind of looking at it in the wrong perspective, but like, Jack, what do you reckon about it? Yeah, no, uh, on, on the three at the back, I completely agree. Um, I have always said since Harry Toffolo came in, and I'm not going to lie, when Harry Toffolo first came in, I was not convinced um, at all because he's always had this sort of uh, defensive, the lack of defensive positioning and awareness. So I've always said he is a fullback built for a three at the back. He he will he wants to get forward and I appreciate that like I can t- I respect that and I think he's brilliant at it but he's he's built for a three at the back so having a three at the back and I think Naby is too I think because he drifts so far left I think having three centre backs um would really help Naby and so uh, not Naby and so Naby and so <laughs> and um, probably Pippa on the other side as well because Pippa isn't strongest defensively uh, but he is no. very good going forward as we all know or we should know. Um, so yeah, and um, on why is Nabi Sar not performing to the standard he was? Could it be his partner? Could it be that he doesn't work with Keel? I mean, I might be, I'm probably grasping at straws here. I don't know if I think that's it, but it is a possibility that he just did build a good partnership with Romani, and now he's sort of losing that, or maybe even Steam, and I don't know, but um. Yeah, I, I just I don't know. Is there anything more we can say about the first half? Um, I, I don't no, know. well, I've got something. Um, just when you mentioned um, how Navi was kind of at the top of his game, I mean, does that contrast there with when he's defending? He's so out of control, and I, and I will say it, he's out of control in in kind of loose uh, areas of play. In the air, he's probably the best we've got. Six foot six, huge. No one's winning a header, but. For him to, you know, take that ball down from Pippa against Blackburn like a striker, and he's six foot six. For him to do that and have such control, and then put these booming tackles in, which just don't work, it's it's completely separate ends of the spectrum. So, I think definitely, I think if I was someone to do with uh, the club, I'd sit Nabi down and say, look, watch these mistakes. How can you improve? I know not to improve because, like, like you said, he's a he's an experienced, um, experienced player. But yeah, I think that's all we can say about the first half. I, I don't think we want to go on too much and be too, too yeah. negative because we, we did turn it around. Um, we did turn it around, and I think that's the story of Huddersfield Town, um, especially away from home. I don't know um, what is it now? One one win in in eleven um, away games. That's just tragic, but. We can take some positives. Um, I think we've always had that reaction in the second half. Um, you can look at it both ways. Why is it taking us to the second half? To and then you can also look at why are we doing so well in the second half? And I think that was down to one man yesterday, uh, Rolando Arons. He was absolutely brilliant. A complete contrast of uh, in Benzin's first half performance. And um, I'm not sure if that's because of Benzin's Heads kind of drifting away from the club. That's a completely different matter. But Aaron's was absolutely brilliant. Um, I, I know we were speaking uh, on Saturday, so the game of the so the day of the game and uh, after the game, and Jack was saying that he's probably the best one on one in the club. And he, you could say um, he could probably take on any fullback in, champ- in the championship because he was he was sending their um, left back for you know to the shops. Um, and I think. Just having that depth and that impact player is a, is a really, really good thing to have. Um, so I'll go to you, Jack, because you were really feeling surprised yesterday. Um, how do you um, feel that, you know, how do you feel Aaron's um, 
kind of changed the game. Yeah, I, I love Aaron's. I think he's fantastic. Um, I think, as I say earlier, um, if we had him in earlier, I think, um, you know, if we had him when we should have got him in, he would have been uh, even better, which is saying something because I think he's doing fantastically. Yesterday against Luton, he, he showed it. He, um, he, pro- I, he might not have completed all of his dribbles, but it certainly felt like it. There was a moment in the second half in particular where he, um, I believe the term is broke someone's ankle with a little fake. <laughs> yep. um, and uh, he's, he's creative. He's shown that against Bristol. He, he carves out chances. He carves out opportunities. Uh, I, don't, I think he's yet to get a goal contribution for us, um, but that'll come. Um, very two-footed, I think. Uh, he can go left or right. Um, I think it's fantastic to get him for um, what we did get him for. And he's committed a good amount of time to the club, and I think he'll be very important for us going forward. And he showed that yesterday, as you say. The contrast with Mbenza, who's supposedly one of our best players this season, uh, putting in a very, very poor and uninspired performance yesterday. Yeah. And Aaron's coming on and um, doing the business for us. And I, I believe that we might not have uh, got something out of that game without him. But we'll see. Totally agree. I mean, the second half as a whole was just... It, it was a Huddersfield town that we've seen too too few a time. And I mean, we've probably already said it, but I think if, if we played every game like that, we'd be in such a, such a better position because yeah. realistically it's... It leads to the question of kind of what is said at half time because it's not like it's a one off thing. Every single away game will yeah. will be we'll go into half time maybe in a deficit and we'll come out and we'll play ten yeah. times better than the other side. Yeah. And that that's the problem because it it's uh it's we're under the we're under the conch for first half, there'll be a silly mistake, we'll go in one nil. And then from then, Carlos will say what he said at half time. Nobody knows that, and he doesn't really seem the kind of you don't really seem the kind to kind of you know kick off about things. But he you must know. give them he, he, he must do that because there is such a big difference. Because one one end of one end of the spectrum, you know, half time we're going and looking like a, a relegation candidate. We'll come out in the second half. And will look like one of the favourites for the playoffs mm, yeah. without a striker, which leads that <laughs> contrast of if next season we can look at playing that for a full ninety minutes if fitness is back up, and we've got a pro- not maybe not even a proven striker but a striker that will score loads of goals for us, whether that's Josh Carroll or whether that's somebody else, whether that's who might ass, I don't know, but I think that there's a there's a big chance for that to to happen and. Realistically, if that can happen, I think we could be in a very good position next year. But we need to look at right now. I think that it's a, it's a worrying position to be in because you know our away form is terrible. You know we've got two draws on the balance now, which I never thought I'd be saying after coming down from the Premier League. You know we celebrating two draws in a row, and it just kind of leads the question of you know what what is actually going to happen towards the tail end of the season? Are we going to have enough firepower to stay up? Like you know. Start of the season, we were, you know, close to playoffs. Mm-hmm. We're now dangerously close to the relegation zone. Obviously, yeah. there's teams underneath us, but you know, we're we're in a we're in a dangerous position nonetheless. You know, what would you recommend about it, Jack? Like, what do you think? Do you think we'll be? Do you think we'll be safe, or do you reckon that it, you know, it's going to go down to the kind of final days of the, the season? Yeah, I forever try to be the optimist, um, and I think. Yes, we are, what, five points off relegation, but we're six points off the top eight as well. And I think people are very, very quick to um, say we could get sucked into it, but there's other teams that could as well. Um, there's Forest around us who were similar points to us. There's Coventry, there's Birmingham, um, Derby as well, who were very, very close to it. And I've just lost uh, Christian Bielik, who I think is um, a key man for them. And they were starting to get results when he came back. And the first game we missed, they lost 3-0 to Rotherham. So, uh, speaks volumes, I think. Um, so yeah. I'll stop talking about Derby now. Um, yeah, I think it could... I really think it could go either way. Um, I think we get, we're get starting to see players come back now. We're starting to eat Hargo already. Schindler very soon. Karoma in about a month. Um, it's going to be massive, touch wood, because uh, A, 
he should improve the side. B should hopefully improve Toffolo again because uh, yeah. they'll hopefully get that relationship back. Um, him, Lewis, and um, Karoma. Uh, so I think I think we'll be okay. Uh, I certainly do have that little fear in the back of my mind because um, realistically, I think looking over your shoulder and seeing that there's only five points, that, that's two wins and us not to win. I mean, so I don't think we will. I think we are in danger, but I think it have to. Um, I think we have to capitulate even further from here. Mm. I don't see that happening. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, and you mentioned Hog earlier on. Um, came back and he was just so refreshing, wasn't he? Every single tackle, hundred and ten percent, and he was getting them right. And that's where players like Saar kind of falter when they do commit to a tackle. Um, they don't get it right. 99.9% of the time and that's where Hogg does every single tackle and that might be because he's played football for donkey's years but he's just he's brilliant in the side he makes us tick and you wouldn't have thought he'd been out for a number of weeks when you you know if you were a neutral uh, seeing him play yesterday he was outstanding and um, just to kind of uh, make this um, a bit more positive I thought Bakuna um, for the past three games and especially yesterday, he was he was brilliant. Um, and there's always um, some flashpoints with Bakuna. You had when he went on a brilliant run um, about half an hour in. Correct me if I'm uh, yeah, wrong. Um, everything was right except the shot. Now that is Bakuna summed up. And also um, he had a brilliant opportunity when we had four players in the box and started to shoot. That is Bakuna. He will always have. And it's quite unfortunate because he'll always have um, himself and his kind of personal um, successes over the the sides. Um, and I think he does love the club, and we've seen it. But I think he's um, I think he's he's an Instagram player, and uh, he does like to kind of show off and stuff like that. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But I think. We were speaking yesterday, um, Ben, and we were saying that his past three performances have been probably 80% quality. So, with the you know with these consistent performances, do you see the two have been um, kind of vital for us for the for the rest of the season? Completely. I mean, first and foremost, I'd I'd just like to say. You know, rest in peace to our Twitter views because you know you speak you speak about Bakuna on Twitter and you know you've got thirty forty people saying that he's the worst player the club's ever seen and that yeah. doesn't deserve yeah. to play for the side. I think if you're saying that after the past three games, yes, he'll have his critics. You know, final product is at times still not there. You know, the um, past three games have been quality. Obviously, yeah, like yeah. you mentioned, that uh, he had that chance where he shot instead of passing off to O'Brien. Is that a case of has he been told to shoot more? Has he been told to kind of keep the ball away from O'Brien? Is he not confident enough in O'Brien's ability to score? Is he more confident in his ability to score? We don't know the ins and outs of that. But I mean, if you're going to bring up the, the, the that fact, you've got to also bring up the fact that he was vital for the goal. You know, that yeah, set piece was, was brilliant. Uh, I can remember that I was thinking that he could have shot. And it was a very shoot. It was a very shootable position, you know. I think uh, on another day there was a chance that he might have shot, but he played a brilliant ball into the box, which caused problems for the Luton defence, and we scored mm-hmm. from it. And I think that's not spoke about enough because, realistically, without that, without him seeing that, I don't think we'd have got a point yesterday, which is frustrating. But it also shows that he there is there is a very very good player there when he wants to. I mean, this past week of football, he has proved very much so that. Yes, I think he is very much a player that Huddersfield Town need to keep. And if Huddersfield Town can get him playing at a good level, then Janino Vacuna could be one of these standout players for us next season. I mean, over the past week, I think my opinion about keeping him has changed a lot. I think that if we can keep him and he's given, you know, proper time and he's given a proper role, because we've got to remember as well, he's not had a consistent role for ages now. And I think this is like the first time where he actually has because of the injuries. Mm. I mean, even still, he played as a as a right back yesterday. He played as a centre mid, but he's young as well. Yeah, exactly. He's what I think he's twenty three, something like that. So I mean, he's still yeah. got to mature and stuff. If we can tie him down and you know say to him, you know, look, 
there's a player in you. We want to keep you. We want to, you know, we want to move forward with you as a player. We understand there'll be offers, but as a club, we'd like to keep you because you can be a vital player in this team. And if he's given that trust and he's backed himself, because obviously we speak about managers being backed, but like, you know, players have to be backed as well. And if we can say to Bakuna, look, you're going to be one of the main focal points in this side, because he's proved that he's got the quality there. He's proved oh, that he's yeah, got definitely. the talent. He's just the, uh, I don't want to say na- naivety, but he's got that naivety that because he was one of the Premier League players, you know, he's instantly going to be brilliant. But I mean, that's another factor into it. He obviously, he's a Premier League player when we signed him so obviously that wage is going to be higher so it depends on if you know the wage issue is that is that going to be a massive thing because I think he'll be probably one of the higher earners at the club towards the end of the season yeah. when everybody leaves so it, it again leaves that question there of what happens do we tie him down another contract can we afford another contract and I think personally on his day he is the potential to be one of the best midfielders in the league Um, mm. you know don't shoot the messenger but I think there is very much a player there and I think that if we can tie him down and he's given trust and he's given a pre- consistent position and a consistent role, mm. I think we could be looking at, you know, one of the future players that could spearhead a p- promotion push. But then it leaves yeah. the question of what happens if Iting comes back? You know, we don't know if he will do. Does Iting get into the side over Bakuna? And I mean, you know, you mentioned the, the coming back of Karoma. What what's the what's the lineup when players come back from injury? Like you know, I want to get both of your opinions on this because I think there's so many routes that we could go down with the potential lineup. So Jack, what do you think? Who do you think comes back into the side? Like what do you reckon happens with formation with players coming in and out? Because obviously, you know, Karoma that he comes into a, a, an attacking side. Um, who did he take the place of Benza? He wasn't brilliant yesterday. Aaron's who was brilliant. You know, Holmes has been brilliant, but is he a winger? You know, so what do you think about it? Yeah, first of all, thank you for stopping talking about Bakuna because I was worried we'd get mass reported, and I quite like doing this, so I don't <laughs> want our channel to get taken down. <laughs> so anyway, no, yeah, um, the defense. I think our centre back, our best partnership is uh, still Saar and Romani. Uh, I think um, Toff and Pippa, uh, no problem. Um, but then obviously you could play them as wing backs and um, have maybe a Vieco or maybe even Hogg dropping as a centre half. You never know. Um, midfield: um, Lewis O'Brien. Um, I think Dwayne Holmes could be that. I think we've got a lot of options in midfield, which is important. So I'm not going to actually outline a yeah. uh, midfield. Um, and then your front three: uh, I would say still say Corona, Touchwood, uh, Nias, and um, then. I'd still say Mbenza, um, because one bad game doesn't um, turn his season around. Um, Aaron's is fantastic, but I still say our best front three does have Mbenza in it. Yeah, I can I can totally agree. Um, now there's one player who I think um, is as controversial as uh, Adama Diakabi, and that is Alex Pritchard. Now. I think you'll you'll all agree he has been completely underwhelming, but then you also agree that there's a player in there, and no matter how much you dislike him, I don't think anyone can deny that there is a player in there because just look what he did for Norwich um, with Madison, and obviously um, we saw, and I know it, it was one game, but, you know we saw what he could do against Bournemouth um, when he made his debut. Now yesterday he came on. I think it was the 70th minute. Um, instantly, he um, drew that free kick, which led to our goal. Uh, theatrics, yes, but uh, and it, it was very theatrical. But that's a positive, and I'm not I, I'm not meaning to you know clutch at straws here. But there was that um, added energy to him because when he he normally comes on and yeah he puts him he puts himself about he runs he you know standard what a footballer should do but I think yesterday there was uh, you know there was that aspect to him where he was making incisive passes and stuff like that so it's positive but I just hope that can carry on because I I for one know that there's a player in there um, and he gets a lot of stick from the fans and maybe rightfully so because um, he's you know, he normally looks disinterested. Um, 
But with that performance, and I'll take it to any of you, would you would you say if he stays at the club and he kind of works with Carl, do you think this could be a turning point for Pritchard? Um, no. Well, I mean... Yeah, you can no. go. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, Obviously, I think there was interest from QPR. Uh, there was rumours about, I think, Bournemouth or maybe Norwich looking at him as well. Mm. Whether that's to be believed, I don't know. Uh, whether anything actually came in for him, we don't know. Whether he wanted to leave, we don't know. But yesterday, I think we saw... A, I, don't, I don't think we saw an Alex Pritchard playing for Huddersfield Town. I think we saw Alex Pritchard playing for a contract yeah, from definitely. anybody that will do. And I think... Yep. Whilst that is annoying, I don't know if that's a contract from us, I don't know if that's a contract from QPR, Bournemouth, Norwich, somebody that comes down from the Prem, somebody that's going to push for promotion, I don't know. But that's not a, I don't, that was a pretty hard playing for a contract, playing for a move, yeah. playing for a, a new contract here, playing for a, a role, I don't know. But it didn't look like anything that we've seen of Alex Pritchard before, he was an energy to the side. I think obviously I, I was somewhat frustrated when he came off, but following, you know, Toff's red card, which we will mention uh, after this. I think I think it gave a, a, a new definition to the side. He was got he was playing with good passes. He looked something going forward. It was it was Alex Pritchard that we spent ten million pounds on, you know. It wasn't Alex mm. Pritchard that we've had for the past three seasons. That was the kind of Norwich yeah. form that we need. And once again it's about consistency because I don't think he's really consistently had a role. I don't think he's really consistently had a position in the side, you know, he's played left wing, left mid probably played right wing at times as well as played as a number 10 he's played as an 8 you know he's played injuries everywhere as well pitch. injuries uh, and, he's, he's yeah, injuries the table. yeah exactly so they look like a pretty hard play for a contract whether that's with us or, some, us or somebody else you know but obviously he came off because of the the top of low red card so I mean like what what was your opinion on the red card then Jack like did you think uh, do you think it was a fair red card do you think it was something that the club's going to rescind I mean obviously Lee Bromby, I think he said at the time that the club were probably going to rescind that. I don't know if that was him saying it as a as a commentary personnel or as a as a club personnel. But what what are your opinions on that then? Yeah, just first, I, I agree with everything you said about Pritchard's performance, but I I don't think he'll get a new contract with us. I think yeah, we've got no. other days where he can afford his wages, so he will be. I think he'll be gone, but he did play well. But there, yeah, on the red card. Um, I, I don't know. I'm 50-50 on it. I, I can see why it was given. Would I have given it? I don't know. Is that because I'm a Huddersfield Town fan again? I don't know. Um, it was it was a rash one. He, he did slip, but it still, he was, I, I, I would say he was he out of control. Like that, wasn't it? Yeah, he, he caught him high, he studs up. Um, so, I don't, in my heart of hearts, I don't think it'll get rescinded. Um I think it was again quite unprofessional of Bromby to say that, um, quite uh, because I don't know, say that so soon after a tackle to say that it will be rescinded or whatever he did say. I'm not sure, but yeah, no, I think I think he kind of hinted towards the fact that the club right. would be looking to rescind it following seeing the replay. Right. Yeah. But well, obviously, that, then that, you run the that... risk of an extra game of suspension because obviously it's three. Yeah. I think it's three games now. So whilst there's a chance that it can get taken down to less time or get completely removed, you could also lose the risk of uh, losing Irish after four games. Which is it worth good. it? I'd, is it worth it? We don't know. Yeah, uh, just the, the thing is, it's a process reviewing to appeal. And it's yeah. not something that you decide in the moment after seeing one or two replays. And no, no, it's no. not something you want to be saying. And I don't want to... I don't want to touch on that for too long because uh, I think it speaks for itself. So, do I, I probably think we'll be at, without Toff for three games. I quite like Jaden Brown. I think he's quite good. I think he, I, I, just, I believe he's a lot more defensively sound than Harry Toffer was. Mm. He obviously doesn't have what uh, Toff has going forward or anything close. But I, I'm not too concerned having him at left back. But he's injured at the moment, so um, we shall yeah. see uh, by next Saturday. Um, but yeah, just talking of next Saturday, I think um, probably about time we do go into looking forward to next Saturday. I think we've covered everything from this week. So, what are your guys' thoughts on the Wickham game? Yeah, I'll uh, I'll start off by saying Wickham, and I think you said it um, in the episode weekly, uh, our first weekly review. Uh, I can't speak today. You said that Wickham are everything we can't win against, and I completely agree. They they will sit in a low block. They will camp in their own half. 
they are more than happy to have 11 players in their own half and just we'll probably we'll probably have 70 percent possession uh, when we do get a chance we won't put them away um, and that's not me being shady that's me being realistic at, at this moment in time as a Huddersfield Town fan and it's sad reality um, I doubt we will kind of get anything out of the game I think we'll get I think we'll get a point which is obviously something but I don't I can't see us outscoring Wickham just because I don't see us getting through their cluster of players who will just sit there and they are a team full of units aren't they I mean it speaks for itself when I think Akin Fenway and they've got another one of their strikers who is just huge. Um, I don't think they'll be doing much pressing. So it will be an interesting game and I think we'll have to either match their physicality and maybe play Hog and Vallejo um, or completely switch it the other way. We play small, nimble players um, and out past them. So it will be an interesting one and I think we do have that um, kind of home advantage where we do start really well and maybe score we normally score in the first 10 minutes don't we um, but yeah I think I've rambled on a bit too much but I think general consensus is it will be a very very hard game and I'm sure you two will uh, kind of feel the same I mean I think it'll be you know you see people on, on Twitter say people are paying for Sky Sports to see Fulham Burnley People are people are gonna pay I follow to see you know Oldersfield Wickham. I think it's gonna be. It, I don't think it'll be a good game to be honest. I think it'll no. be. I, I don't want to be pessimistic because of, I, I, that's not me. Um, I think realistically, they, they, I said it last week. It needs to be a. It's a must-win game. Uh, they're in the relegation zone at the moment. If we want to be, you know, showing that we're not anywhere near that, we need to be. You know, showing a dominant performance. Yes, Wickham are a, are, a, are a good side on the day. You know, they'll hold people out. They'll frustrate the the you know, the hell out of you. But you know, they they're a, they're a poor side in this division. You know, they've got a few points this season. They're in the relegation zone, as I've mentioned. It's a must-win game. If we will do, I don't know. Obviously, there's the lack of goals, which we spoke about this week. We spoke about it last week as well. You know. Nabi Sars on four, I believe, and uh, Campbell's on oh, five, yeah. uh, which is, is it's a tough one because that's a, that's our striker and he's got five goals and our centre half's got four. Mm. Two of them are in one game, but all of them have been good goals. Like you know, he scored yeah. two headers, he scored two with his feet now, where he's shown like you know striker's instinct as such. Mm. And it sounds horrible to say it, but at times he looks more like a striker than Fraser Campbell does. Yeah. So it's worrying that our striker doesn't have as much kind of goal threat and poacher threat as Nabi Sar, who's a who's a centre back and has played centre back pretty much for the past ten years of his career. But like, I mean, is that me being silly, Jack, or is that something that you know? Um. No, no, I, don't, I really don't think it is because um, we didn't really, we haven't really gone in depth on his goal because it was a fairly simple goal, but it was good yeah. movement. And um, I did say last night um, when we were talking to you guys, I don't think Campbell scores that. I, I, it, it was a tapping, but I don't think he has the movement to score that. I, I like Fraser Campbell, I, I, I really do, but I, I just, I don't think he does, and I would. I would probably back Naby to score more than I would Fraser Campbell playing up front for us, yep. and that's quite worrying. Yep. Um, but yeah, on Wickham, uh, I think it'll very much be attack on defence. I think they're a threat from set pieces. They're nothing to um, their league position is nothing to um, take from it because it will be a tough game. I don't think it'll be a good game, like Ben said. I think it'll be one that we've frustrated at. That said, I don't think we'll lose. Um, I'm being bold putting myself out there like this and I fully expect if we do lose for this to be recorded and um, spread for the rest of my life. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I just think um, it'll probably either be a nil-nil or a one-nil. Um, there won't be many goals, if any, uh, because they are so resolute and everything we hate to play against. Um, it'll be interesting to see if or when we get Nias in by because um, there's a, there's a chance, a very slim chance that we could have him by then and that could be a bit of a difference maker but uh, we shall see. 
Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'd be lying if I was um, looking forward to the game next week. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, I think before we finish, because we kind of covered on everything today, um, we've launched a separate series called the Terriers Talk Guest Show, and we released episode one in the week, where we spoke to uh, Ryan Mather, who was um, who is the founder of the Proud Terriers Group, and. I think it's important that we speak about this um, now where people, you know, um, where a mainstream audience will be watching it. Um, if you haven't watched it, we would kind of widely recommend you to watch it because it was a real eye opener. I'm sure lads, you'll agree with me. Um, yeah. It was a, it, it was, it was a different experience. And I think we took away many valuable um, kind of concepts and lessons and we would, Kind of strongly urge you to head over. You can find it in our playlist, the Terriers Talk guest show, and have a watch. Even if even if that's for five, six, seven, ten minutes out of the forty we did it. Um, because it it's a really important topic, and I think for any homophobia or prejudice at all to be happening at Huddersfield Town Football Club is not on. And I think um, the sooner we kind of stamp that out, and it comes to the like the younger community like us. Um, I think the better people's experiences of football will be. So having said that, um, I'll leave it to you, Ben, to kind of uh, tie everything off. Yeah, so I mean, uh, at the end of the video, um, obviously because it's on YouTube, uh, you can see uh, there'll be a, like a subscribe button um, at the bottom right-hand side of the screen or the bottom left-hand side. And then there'll also be a, a link to the most recent video, which will be the uh, the guest show one that we did. So if you have another spare 40 minutes, which was about the time that we took uh, with that episode, uh, if you could give it a watch, uh, it was a massively insightful thing for the three of us. It's been really well received on Twitter as well. Um, you know, the fact that like we, that so much information was portrayed in it and the different kind of experiences in football, because, you know, as, as, as young Huddersfield Town fans, you know, we might not have seen it as much as, you know, as much as Ryan, as who's a bit older than us, um, so just kind of seeing that and seeing how prevalent it is, because obviously we're only kind of getting to the point now where, you know, we can potentially make a difference with it. It, it might not be a massive difference, but it, the fact that we can give a somewhat difference is, is massive for us. So, yeah, if you could give it a watch, um, then it would be massively appreciated because it was it was a massive eye-opener for us. And I mean, Jack, if you want to if you want to finish off the video, do you yeah, have anything else to uh, add? Yeah, I just want to say thank you again. Thank you for all your lovely messages. Um, we we are trying to build something here, and we are trying to um, just create something for people to enjoy and for us to enjoy doing that. I, I think speak for I'm loving doing this. Um, it is a process, and it will improve week on week. So just thank you for every all your support. And um, yeah, just uh, if you can, uh, if you aren't already, if you can subscribe, share it around, that'd be brilliant. And uh, we will see you in the next episode. So thank you. See you later.